Hi everyone, um, welcome back to our series of webinars. We've got a great presentation for you lined up today. And as always, they're going to be recorded and then uploaded to the news section of our website. And so that's where you can see um, this one and any others which you might have missed um, on the news section. So check those out there. Uh, I'm Catherine Smale, I'm Ekazia Callahan's marketing manager. Um, and if you want to chat or say hello or ask a question, then there's a little chat box down in the corner of your screen. So um, if you're watching or if you're watching uh, for anywhere else in the world, then let us know. We always love to know where kind of uh, where our audience is. That'd be great. Um, just say hello, pop your questions in there. Um, Ian and Graham will take questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we've got a great turnout today. Um, there are currently around about 200 of the 346 which is registered and the number is climbing. Um, climbing as we speak, quite a few people just joining us now. Um, I'm going to hand you over to the two presenters that we've got for you today. Um, and so our, um, the first is Graham Colt. He's our technical director. And he was Echo Zio Callahan's first employee, which is a, a great little fact. With Glass for about the last 20 years. Um, and he also has a research and development group. Um, our other presenter for today is Ian Langham, who's the director of, um, of the Glass and Complex Envelopes group that we've got. Um, and I'm going to hand you over to Ian now because he's going to introduce himself a bit more um, as presentation. So I'll hand you over now. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, Kat. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining and uh, you know, giving some of your precious time. I know there's lots of uh, webinars around at the minute and it's glad that you're here listening to us rather than indulging yourself uh, with fitness videos with the likes of Joe Wicks. That's great. Uh, I'm Ian Langham. I, uh, I run the specialist glass and structural envelope team here in the London office at EOC and together with Graham Colt, uh, hopefully today we'll give you a bit of an insight into how we deliver these complex uh, uh, engineering envelopes. Uh, I've been at EOC for coming up to 10 years now and have worked on many challenging and rewarding projects. Uh, but I recently found myself asking the question, you know, how is it and why is it that we're able to undertake these in the first place? Um, I found that the, the reason that we can deliver, that deliver these uh, technical projects is really the way that our culture has evolved and developed over the years. And there's some key attributes that I think are common across all the projects, and I think we will, we will share those with you today. Uh, we often give presentations and uh, show uh, some of the state-of-the-art projects that we've worked on, uh, and sometimes it's a bit, e bit, e bit too easy to look at the final sexy images and the you know, impressive uh, metrics, and excuse me if I do the same thing again today, uh, but I think the culture, the people, the, the processes, uh, tell a far more interesting interesting story in my opinion. So these are the five key attributes that we're going to broadly talk around today. Uh, the first one is uh, having an inquisitive nature and culture. Uh, the second is a focus on detailing. Third, uh, research and development. Fourth, collaboration, particularly with the makers and contractors. And finally, uh, digital design. Uh, of course, there are other important aspects to consider, uh, and these ones aren't exclusive to EOC, but these are the ones that we feel particularly passionate about, and hence are going to talk a, a little bit more about today. Uh, I'll give an overview of uh, each of these attributes uh, one by one, and I'll also give a small case study at the end to give you some examples of this, and then Graham will follow on with his uh, examples of his own experience. So starting off with uh, inquisitive nature, uh, most of our team uh, come from a structural engineering background, but I think it's a uh, testament to their inquisitive nature that they've ended up studying uh, and working on projects that involve quite specialized uh, challenges. Uh, and I think it says a lot about their inherent curiosity. Um, and I think most of them have that you know, since they were very young and we try to encourage that as much as we can. Uh, I know from my perspective, uh, I've always tried to revert back to that curious nature that we naturally have when we're young. And uh, that's a bit of an embarrassing picture of me when I was uh, younger, opening some Technic Lego. 
and a more handsome uh, model um, showing that that never really leaves us. And for those that saw James's presentation webinar a few weeks ago, we'll see the pride of place that he takes uh, showing the Technic Lego behind him on the shelf. Uh, many of the projects that we work on don't just have structural challenges, but we need to consider other aspects such as thermal or environmental or weather tightness. And we need to bring those together holistically to give the best value for our clients. And I think it's the inquisitive nature of the, of the engineers that uh, leads them to develop and learn new skills to be able to do that uh, and develop skills outside of their traditional craft and dream up crazy ideas such as this uh, glass slide that we, uh, uh, glass seesaw that we developed. I think by taking off the blinkers and uh, initiating research and development and having a bit more of an open view to uh, better understand the wider engineering world is, um, and not being too constrained by a label. Uh, I don't really see myself as a structural engineer really, I'm just an engineer, uh, is the key. A good example of this is our first ventures into the marine world where uh, I think our, our curiosity and perhaps our naivety um, on the typical rules and uh, the normal way of doing things uh, were, were, were actually an, an attribute to us on those projects. Uh, and also, I, I remember one of our team telling me the story of how um, how furious his wife was when he dismantled the, uh, the washing machine in his London flat uh, just for the purposes of seeing how it worked. Um, and I think for me, that sort of says it all really about the inquisitive nature that you need uh, to do these types of projects. So next on to uh, detailing, a focus on detailing. Uh, through working with glass, we, it's forced us to become uh, a bit obsessive about, uh, about details. Uh, sometimes to our own detriment, uh, these days we can't often walk past the building and just enjoy it for what it is. We have to zoom right in, stand a meter away and, and focus in on the details. But I think here you can see on the screen uh, shows some example of our commitment and development of details over the years on some of the Apple staircases that we've worked on. And uh, we also apply the same, same rigor needed for glass onto other materials and other systems. Sometimes high level conceptual sketching is important, uh, but more often than not, to truly understand how, how the materials go together and the, uh, the, the interconnected nature, we need to develop details to quite a, uh, an in-depth level. So you know, we like to think that we can develop them to uh, a level where we can confidently hand over to a contractor uh, without much change, potentially. Uh, this is an example of a project we worked on an Apple store in Guangzhou, a staircase, which is supported by uh, a glass facade. And um, it has many details on it, which uh, both us, Apple, Foster and Partners, and Sealy have all uh, agonized over. And I think the ironic thing here is that you don't even see them. The tools that we that we use, uh, the powerful, you know, three D three uh, D drawing or rendering tools, uh, and our in house three um, uh, D printing to enable us to prototype details, uh, help us to uh, better understand how things go together. Uh, and as much as we're trying to create the the perfect detail, we we're always learning from new new projects when they're completed, which is feeding back and we constantly looping around, improving the way that we do things. Uh, I like this uh, very simple, um, small project that we worked on. Uh, this is um, the stone remnants of a Norman, Norman Abbey, which is apparently where uh, Alfred the Great was buried. And I, I like it because it, although it's a small project, it, it still shows the uh, level of uh, thought and detail um, to try and uh, express the uh, intricate stone and make the glass uh, the glass fade into the background as much as possible. And uh, this project here, which is uh, in Kunming, another Apple Apple store, uh, this builds upon the knowledge built from the Steve Jobs Theatre, which Graham will talk about later on. Uh, it has structural glass, which supports a carbon fiber roof. Uh, and we also have uh, an acrylic uh, skylight in the middle. So many things coming together, um, and this is, um, the reason why I show this is it, it's, it's a, uh, an evolution of uh, the details that we've uh, learned from previous projects. 
So on to research and development. I think new ideas uh, and processes take time to develop. And sometimes we're lucky, lucky to and fortunate that we can do this on live projects, such as the one shown here. This is um, a project in Hong Kong for, for Swire. Uh, and we've developed a innovative uh, integrated cable facade system. This is 16, 16 meters tall um, and has some curved glass, which is quite complicated. But I think more often than not, it, it requires a longer term commitment uh, and effort to bring to fruition outside of projects. I think it's important for us to uh, invest time to collaborate with external parties and universities uh, and bring our own ideas and thoughts to the table and hopefully bring around some real change within the industry. Uh, this example here is um, is a super yacht where we um, we won an innovation of the year and it has curved glass, doubly curved glass, but has combined chemically toughened glass uh, and annealed glass so that we can get the geometry that we want, the double curved geometry, but also still get the uh, some degree of solar performance by uh, adopting a coating. Uh, we also like to challenge the, our staff to do their own R&D projects. Uh, normally, if you make time for uh, for, a, and, uh, for for a subject that someone's particularly passionate about, uh, then normally that's a good recipe for having uh, good research and development. We've recently been developing a uh, glass pavilion made from from thin glass. Uh, this is actually showing a timber prototype that we uh, that we built ourselves just to investigate the geometry, uh, and we hope that the final glass version will be ready in time for a glass tech later later this year. But with the current situation, let's see. Um, another example where we've been investing in research and development is uh, the initiative we have within the team for uh, investigating embodied carbon within glass. Now, we see ourselves as um, uh, well placed to help uh, understand that better. And we've tasked every individual within the team to, to develop this themselves. But However much we like to innovate and come up with uh, crazy ideas, we ultimately need to see if it works. And testing is key to that. And we have to work with suppliers and contractors to constantly learn and get a tactile feel for what will also work next time. I think on the whole, uh, people can be quite resistant to change. Uh, but we see one of our, our main roles is to challenge the status quo and ask, ask everybody uh, how can they do things better. I think it's only through a true collaboration and a, and a real understanding of the risks that, that true innovation can happen. So collaboration is another important aspect, particularly, as I say, with the makers and the builders. Uh, one thing that is true of the glass and the envelope industry is that it's never, it's never static. You just as you think you've got a good handle on all the processes and different uh, options that are out there, something else appears on the market. Uh, projects like the Skypool shown here, which is uh, we've worked in collaboration with uh, Reynolds, uh, the acrylic specialist, and also this project here, which is an Apple store in Macau, which has stone laminated within the glass. That was a collaboration with uh, Glass Trusher. Really good examples of this. I think we we need to, all of us need to to keep keep in mind to keep improving the links with the. With the makers and contractors uh, and we try and do this uh, at eoc through uh, industry conferences and spending uh, a lot of time actually at the production facilities and also on site to see how how the things are being made uh, in, in some ways we see ourselves not just as engineers but also as as impartial facilitators that that can connect people together as well uh, we're lucky enough to have worked with some of the same producers and contractors again and again, and that's helped us to better understand, understand the challenges that they face uh, during their production and uh, installation. And then we can also get feedback for our, for our own projects and detailing. Uh, some of the best projects that we've helped deliver are often the ones that the contractor gives early input on uh, so that we can work together and find the most suitable design solutions. Albeit, I also think that uh, a certain degree of friction is also a good thing. So we're also trying to push them a little bit outside their, their comfort zone. Like any good personal relationship, um, we both try and get the, the best, push our views to get the best out of each other. Uh, this example here from a project in Bangkok, I can't say am, 
uh, which is a cable net facade that we worked in close collaboration with Sealy is a really good example of that. And finally, uh, last but not least, digital design. Uh, we couldn't deliver our projects without the, the tools and key, uh, key processes, uh, digital design processes that we have. Uh, from our very first glass projects that required in-depth finite element analysis, we've always tried to improve the way that we work and, and investigate new software. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but you have to try and, uh, and give things a go and, and, and invest time to see if they work for you or not. I think our digital, uh, our digital design skills uh, enable us to not, not only work quicker, but also it gives us more time to be a bit more creative and, um, and also help to refine the design. Uh, digital design is quite a broad, a broad topic these days, but for us, it includes a number of tools and workflows and, uh, and skills. And we also, we also have uh, specialists within the, within the office uh, that help to sort of spearhead and tackle some of the more complicated challenges such as grid shell optimization. Uh, you can see here an example of some topology optimization that helps us to create uh, organic uh, organic structures that can act as in inspiration to architects for grid shell structures, and also an example of uh, some geometry optimization that we often do, uh, where we're trying to uh, manipulate from a, a, a conical curvature to a cylindrical curvature in glass, which helps to uh, improve the well, reduce the costs and um, uh, and just make it easier easier to easier to construct. I think in some ways we are quite fortunate right now that um, we have the we have the the challenge of embodying carbon, but we also have the the tools to enable us to uh, ever optimize the design and, and and reduce the materials, which is going to become um, really crucial. I think to help us to reduce the amount of embodied carbon and maybe even allow us to work on new planets as well. So I'm going to give uh, a quick, uh, some quick tangible examples uh, using a project that we worked on with Carnival, for Carnival Corporation in collaboration with Martin Francis, uh, Maya Werft and Freyner Reifer. Uh, we were tasked to design the Sky Dome uh, on top of this 340 meter long um, cruise ship and this is a key entertainment space within the vessel uh, but before I do that uh, we just uh, activated a poll uh, and we'd like to know we'd like to know your thoughts on the those five attributes which one do you think is the most important to you in the way that you're working in uh, and the things that you perceive and then we can when we finish we can review that at the end and, and discuss so uh, inquisitive nature. I'll give some examples on this project. Uh, we we had applied uh, land-based experience to marine projects in the past, like I said before, on super yachts. But we hadn't done anything on this scale. This is uh, this sky dome. This glass grid shell is 40 meters uh, by 30 meters, approximately on plan. Um, and it also has, has a very low arch rise because of the constraints of the uh, the. The, the shipbuilding hall that the, 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 the cruise ship was being built within. Um, and I think it's fair to say uh, the inquisitive nature on this project was really spearheaded by uh, the designer, Martin Francis, who was the one who originally questioned the original intent, which was to use the ETFE roof. And he, he thought that the, using a glass, a glass grid shell would be, uh, would be a better option. And I think his his curious his curious nature was infectious to us. Uh, the shipyard had already uh, accounted for uh, the, the the foil roof being the, um, the the dome of choice. So we're always fighting an uphill battle to keep the weights down uh, as the the overall hull had been designed for the weight of a, a, foil, a foil roof. So on to detailing. So some, some, some important aspects for us on this project were uh, a focus on, on the node interface uh, for the grid shell and how we could best optimize this to save weights uh, whilst respecting the geometry and visual aspects. Uh, we'd actually originally thought about using cylindrical uh, nodes to try and reduce the weight, but in, a, in the end, it ended up being a, uh, a machined piece uh, due to aesthetical reasons. Uh, we also had to connect the dome 
to the main hull structure. Now the hull, you know, it twists and it and it, and it warps and, uh, at sea conditions, and we didn't want to impart impart those loads into the grid shell and then have to increase the size and the weight. So we introduced some sliding bearings around the perimeter and only fixed the the dome uh, horizontally at one end. Research and development uh, grid shells. They've been done many times before uh, on, on land, but uh, we face some particularly new challenging aspects here, uh, such as dynamic effects from the engine frequencies and accelerations from the, the ship movements at sea. And also the ship can be anywhere. So we have a wide range of environmental conditions that it could be subjected to. Uh, we also had to respect the uh, classification society, RENA, in this case, is rules and try and convince them sometimes of our approach where we're de deviating from the from the normal codes. Uh, we had to do a number of tests to, to, to give confidence to everybody that it was a workable solution. And I think the most exciting of those was to fire a, uh, an ice ball at the glass um, to see whether it would uh, resist the hail, uh, the hailstones that would be subjected to. And we also did some uh, post failure um, robustness checks. The heat strength in glass isn't, isn't actually specified in the arena code. So we had to convince the everybody that it was the right choice for using in overhead glazing. Uh, collaboration, I think this is the probably the most important aspect of this project was the collaboration between uh, us, the yard and the specialist contractor, Fren and Reifer, uh, to develop a system that could meet all those engineering requirements, but still be constructed to tight tolerances and be coordinated with quite a complex, um, complex seri series of wider shipbuilding operations. Uh, this is an image of the final final node here. Uh, I think it's testament to both the yard and Frena and Reifer that they had the confidence to to build the entire dome, uh, including the glass, at ground level uh, in the dry dock, and then lift it up to 120 tons uh, using a in a, a 750 ton crane on top of the, the mega block which had been constructed nearby. The success of that lift and the installation was was in part due to the level of prefabrication uh, and uh, check of fit using the CNC uh, machine nodes, uh, and also uh, the yard's knowledge of such challenging lifts, which aren't particularly common for, for normal building projects that we often come across. Although I think Graham will give uh, another good example of an impressive example of where that's happened uh, also. So some images of the, the lift onto the ship. Uh, and finally, digital design. So as I mentioned, weight was our main enemy on this project. And through using the optimization scripts, we were able to, to limit the size of each individual beam to reduce the overall weights. Uh, we did some uh, initial studies to assess the form and the pattern, but I think what was different here um, compared to perhaps other grid shell projects we've worked on in the past was that the global buckling and the vibrations were really the key drivers. So what we did is we uh, we um, we wrote our in-house our own in-house scripts to suit our our needs, uh, and in the end, that enabled us to get the most optimized uh, optimized design, and we could use the, the fine element software of our choice to to analyze this. So uh, that's it from me. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to Graham, who's going to continue the discussion and go into a little bit more detail and give insight based on his own experiences. Uh, great, thanks Ian for that. Hopefully you can hear me well enough. Um, as you said Ian, it's easy to fall into the trap of talking about a single project, but uh, that's exactly um, what I'm going to do. Um, I hope, you know, we, we talked on, uh, we in, in introduced the sort of complexities we've been talking about, um, research and development, inquisitiveness, collaborating, focus on technical details and digital design. And it's been quite interesting to see um, the poll. The poll reports come in, and we can we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but what we what clients are typically asking us to do is to to achieve something really quite simple. And so the complexities tend not to be understood, or they're not expressed in the final architecture. Um, and, and so it, it's nice in these sorts of um, to have these opportunities to talk about. The, the, the difficulties and the details that make these um, on on the surface uh, simple facades and envelopes possible. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about Steve Jobs Theatre in California, which is recently complete, uh, completed. Um, but a project of this complexity, we've been working on it uh, for a number of years, and it came as ever after an incremental uh, development of our knowledge, um, working with, and um, incremental development of the fabricators' uh, possibilities. And it started from our first envelope with Apple, or self-standing envelope with Apple, I should say, was uh, Fifth Avenue in New York in 2006. And since then, it's been a consistent relentlessness to simplify the, the structures, um, remove any um, what was con considered uh, additional um, components that aren't needed. Um, and so that the, the detailing that's resulted in that has been relatively complex, but um, the, the structures and the way they've been designed um, have hidden those away. Um, but this diagram quite nicely explains the sort of the scale scale of the project um, theatre that we were um, trying to achieve um, based on the previous designs. It was it was no small feat, and we spent um, well spent a, a lot of time considering whether this was the right thing to do. Um, but thankfully, it was. Um, and if we just look at the, um, the these three projects as an example. Um, in, in 2006, as I previously said, we built the Fifth Avenue, and that had a total of 106 panels. And this wasn't because it was what we wanted to do or what the architect wanted to achieve. This is solely down to what the uh, fabricators were able to produce. Um, Steve uh, Jobs at one point said, well, if we can, can't we just build the whole wall out of a single sheet of glass? Um, he did get a, he, he did get, <coughs> excuse me, Part of the way there in, in 2011, where we reduced 106 panels down to 15. And uh, Apple Zulu really was a culmination of this um, type, of, um, type of vestibule with uh, just five panels and a carbon fiber roof sitting on top. But to talk a little bit more about um, the campus. So this is a section um, at the edge of the roof. So, um, we collaborated with, with uh, a, a number of people to, to make, make this project a reality. And that included not only fabricators, but also other engineers. And uh, Arup were the main engineers for the site. And in the green at the top is the, uh, the roof, which was uh, carbon fiber material in the end. And I'll speak a little bit more about that shortly. Um, but that was resting on top of um, a, gla a glass uh, a barrel, and that in turn sat on a, uh, on a, a ring and with a hole in the center, and oculus, if you like. And that was sitting on the substructure, and that, that was separated from the substructure by some pendulum dampers. Now, as we were not the designers of the, the isolated ring slab, um, we had to collaborate with Arup and, and uh, move our information back and forth to make sure that the inputs we were putting into our model um, related to the inputs they had in their model. And so when we look at these complex systems, what we try and do is, is try and remove, try and think of it as simplicity. So what, what are we really trying to do with And In the Apple theater, essentially we have a roof mass um, and the glass wall, which is restraining that roof mass. And the isolated ring is then sitting on top of a substructure, which when the seismic, um, so seismic event occurs, it is shifting and from left to right in this diagram. So in between the bottom two components, we have these double pendulum isolators. And then on top of that, we have the glass, which is then fixed to the uh, concrete ring. But we also have a connection there, which adds another level of complexity um, and the joint system there has a level of damping and stiffness, which we needed to understand better. In looking at digital design, um, this was some three, four, or even five years ago. So this was uh, digital design, re really when it, it was um, starting, well, when it's in its infancy. Um, but we were using some uh, simple algorithms, although the diagram in the top left looks far from simple. Um, really to look at the trust and how we can 
um, reduce the amount of steel in the truss to the absolute minimum. And what that in turn led to is a highly braced structure, which can be shown on the bottom right diagram. But in the end, as I said, that, that it was a, a carbon fiber uh, solution which was chosen. Um, and, and the reason for this is, is um, a fewfold. Um, partly because of weight, the, the higher the weight we have on the top of the uh, glass structure means that you know the higher loading that is subjected to. But we also have, would have to deal with uh, thermal um, thermal expansions of differential materials, and we wanted to have a really simplistic um, consideration of the details, particularly where the glass is joining the carbon fiber roof, and the use of a steer, uh, the use of carbon fiber enabled us to minimize those uh those um those details and this is um a snapshot really of, of the process of, of designing with arup and uh and pct who are the uh, pct who are the fabricators uh, for the carbon fiber roof and it should be noted that um the carbon fiber roof uh, started off um with, with mark hobbs at Goritz, um who's who is uh helping that process of de developing the design. And, and what we, the way we approached it was we developed our, what we called our reference design weights of um, the weights we um, considered for all these components that were um, sensible. And um, Arup had already done their initial design of the isolator units. Um, so we had their key inputs and total weights and frequency of the structure. We would then feed that back into our design and that would again provide a stiffness and seismic design information uh, for the flexibility and acceleration that the roof would exhibit. Um, PCT would then pass that information back with a final roof weight and we then revise our design with, with the revised roof mass and stiffness and then that information would, would get sent back to Arup for them to input on their larger model including the um, isolator ring slab and then hopefully those uh, answers would be somewhat similar um, but uh, we had a couple of rounds of that and um, until we could get to the final design where we achieved um, a close enough approximation of each other's uh, work. Now for an unwrapped elevation we had 44 panels of glass and um, we had a, re a project in Manchester, uh, Manchester where we supported a, a steel roof on glass previously. And we used the vertical joints um, between the glass uh, panels to provide the lateral stiffness as we could generate really quite a high uh, shear stiffness between the joints. However, that's not possible in this project because in between each glass panel, we had a service conduit. So this would take um, take all the electrics for the uh, and uh, data um, for for the security systems, for the lighting, for the PA systems, and believe it or not, we also have um, a, a fire um, fire um, a fire suppression system in the roof, and the water uh, comes up through um, the service conduits into a ring main in the roof, and so that left 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 us with a bit of dilemma of how to structure it um from a vertical load perspective it's really rather simple um the glass on the as you can see on the left hand side acts as a prop between the top and the base um and we support it via two points from a lateral standpoint where the high loads are generated is that we have to obviously just hold the panel at its base to prevent that lateral shear and it, in the end, the, what we chose to do here was use a structural silicone. And I'll come on to the reason why in a little bit, um, you might consider that a bolted connection might have been um, more, more suitable, but there's a particular reason why we went for silicone. Um, so we had a global model, which uh, gave us the overall movements of the structure. But what we were concerned with is, well, how do we know what the silicon is going to do as it's you know we know it's flexible um, but we've got a rather deep joint that's rather unusual um, being that the structural silicon is largely used for um, simple glazings and so we had a more detailed model which is shown on the right hand side which attempts to 
have a better understanding of, of that effect and what stiffness we can then take into the global um, structure. Similarly, um, we were working with uh, PCT and Gurit in terms of the, the um, definition for the stiffness of the roof, and we th therefore had to input that um, uh, stiffness and collaborate with our model um, to make sure we're, we're calibrating it appropriately. We, we took the seven highest um, uh, uh, recent earthquakes, and that was combined. Um, and that gave us a horizontal acceleration spectra for um, the envelope design. And the silicone testing. So we knew the silicone test testing would act slightly differently. Um, so what we had to do was um, do some testing. And this is a, um, a quite a simple test. We have a glass, glass plate uh, to which each side is bonded um, two metal plates with um, the structural silicone. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see um, that detail. We developed a testing protocol. So there's, um, and this is showing the load versus time of that test. And as we can see that um, we have a single um, load at a, about uh, thir uh, 30 odd seconds. And um, it, it builds into a number of cycles uh, past one minute and then, then the force and the load in in that uh, uh, load in the test sample increases towards the end past 120 20 seconds in, in increments of uh, twi twice and three times the original load. And what you can see is this sort of hysteresis effect. Um, where, when the when the when this came back, we we're, we're quite concerned about this. Um, because it's something that the previous information we've had um, from the silicone supplier um, that, that wasn't on the, the technical specification sheet. So we asked, went back to them and asked, you know, what was this? And after a bit of digging they, they, uh, with their uh, chemical experts, they came back and said, well, it's the Mullins effect, um, which is a dependence of the hyperelastic response on the maximum deformation of previously experienced um, or maximum deformations previously experienced um, or in a plain English it's, it's a stress softening and as you can see that the on the left hand side we have an initial stiffness um, and as the, the the deformations and the strain loading of the material increases um, it, it tends to soften and it was explained to uh, to me by the technical advisor that it's very similar to when you, you stretch your uh, party balloon and uh, before you blow it up, it just makes it that much easier. Uh, nicely modeled by my children there. Um, so we come back to the reason of why would we use a structural silicone in a, such a critical joint in a structure? Well, the answer really comes back to the choice of the glass and the glass is the, the visual um, part of the structure here. And what we, wanted to, what we wanted to achieve is the highest possible quality while maintaining a re residual level of strength that we, we would need to make the structure work. And this simple, simple diagram um, just tr try, tries to uh, show the level of um, options and permutations you can have now, which, which, um, which Ian, Ian was talking about earlier, that, that there's a huge variety of, um, of processing techniques now. Um, you know, previously, we didn't have temper glass and nail glass and heat strengthening glass, but um, the ingenuity, ingenuity of fabricators really helped grow what we can achieve. In the end, we went for a curved, uh, curved tempered, which is warm, uh, Gosh, it, it's a warm bent glass. So effectively, we start off with flat temper glass sheets and they're forced into a mold and he, heated in the autoclave. And when the autoclave cools down, the insulator between the sheets of glass hold, holds those panels in the molded shape with a little bit of spring back. The diff, um, but, um, you know, what, what are the other ones? Other options we looked at, well, annealed sump glass is, you know, has a high, perhaps the highest quality, but a low strength. 
slumped and chemically tempered as a high strength, um, but it really we couldn't achieve the size that we wanted. Um, hot bent, um, poorer quality, uh, and so forth. So you know, th there was a real consideration about what's the best material uh, and what's the best process to achieve the final solution. And in a little bit more detail, you know, what, what's happening when we warm bend the glass? And it, it's really only through understanding this, we can then look at what our residual uh, strength is or how we can use that panel um, in, in an effective structural manner. And if we look at the assembly on the left-hand side, what, what, what below it you can just see uh, in the blue and yellow is um, a description of the, the individual ply. So the green, uh, sorry. The blue is the glass and the yellow is the interlayer, and they're, they're separate at the assembly stage. Then they're, um, uh, then they're put over the mould, and at this point they, there's still shear, um, shear the, 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 pan, the glass panels and the interlayer can slide um, between one another. And because they're being forced into the mould, we're, we're putting some bending stress into the glass so you can see some red and green triangles there for the engineers out there. And once um, the autoclose heated up um, and, and cooled down, the insulator then becomes active. But as it's still being held in, a, in, a, in the mould by straps, um, we haven't got to the final configuration. So in the final state, when we unload the straps, we then have this um, overall bending stress, which is then um, is experienced by the glass, and that then redistributes itself through the um, if you pre-stressing, if you like, of the glass uh, when it's over the mould into into the far right, where we have um, quite high um, stresses in the glass at surface two and surface five, so that the, the glass face is facing the interlayer. And so if we were choosing to use this glass with um, holes as the mechanical restraint, um, we, would have we would have increased that, that load by a considerable amount. And therefore, um, as you can see here in a standard plate diagram, um, particularly with uh, elastic materials, that when um, the load across the plate comes to the hole, it suddenly stops and therefore the stress has to flow around that hole and it bunches up. And so if we consider what we have here with, with the glass panel with two holes in the bottom, um, the stress concentration factor multiplied by the stress in the glass would be to such an extent that it reduce our residual allowance, um, which we could use for, the, for structural purposes. And henceforth, that's why we use the structural silicone. Now, if we look at um, some of the details here, so we've got a detail at the top and the bottom. As I said previously, these are all hidden, but you know that you know as ever they're critical to the design. Um, not not so critical to the architecture, although we spent a huge amount trying to reduce the size of these so we could minimise the impact on the architecture. Um, and at the top here, it's, it's quite a poor quality on my screen, and hopefully you can see it slightly better. Um, but we have a, a rotational pin going through a housing, and we have Hilti in, shown in pink, which uh, deals with the tolerances um, that we have to, um, that, that, it, that is part of the fabrication process. And in the base connection, um, not only do we have that, that silicone, but also we have a fuse element. So in, in standard engineering or a steel frame design, you have uh, fuses which allow the dissipation of energy. But because we're working with glass, which is a purely elastic structure, we don't have the same, um, same performance. So what we had, we in introduced this fuse element. So once we got to a certain load in the glass or certain load, coming through the glass, through the silicone, and through the steel plates. We then get up to a certain stage, and then we can allow that fuse element to plastically yield. Also, as you might imagine, this also caused another level of, um, gave another spring stiffness in which we'd have to feed into our model and, and check what effect that had on the frequency of the system. 
And finally, this is um, the the the, uh, the load um, load diagram showing that as the load increases, um, we have the an, 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 sort of elastic, an elastic mode here, and the the that um, the fuse starts to yield uh, at a load factor of one point one, and it goes on to plastic plastically yield uh, fully plastic at one point six. But all of that is in an effort to really get something that's very simple. Um, it's you know it, it, was, it was a marvelous project to work on. We it was a huge effort um, from all all involved, and it, it, we learned so much through it. And, and um, you know these are sorts of things projects that you know that you really have to question everything to really get the most out of each individual material, um, so you can achieve achieve these goals. Um, and you can see just towards the left of the picture, there's an elevator, and you notice the helically curved rails. And I'll just show a picture, although it's not really part of the presentation, but I think it's really quite something fantastic. And it, I could do a whole another 20 minutes or even an hour talking about this. And this was, again, enormously complex um, uh, task to deliver, but that was great fun. Um, just to wrap up, I mean, th we have all these aspects of um how, how how we see we work um or, or things that we, we really cherish and um and things that really drive us how we work so i would um i wouldn't say these are the only things but i think these are things that we particularly look for and um think that makes um things that make a a good engineer so without f further ado um I'd like to open it up to questions, but um, I don't know, uh, Kat, if I should just uh, take go through the polls because that's some very interesting answers. Yeah, you can go through the polls at the moment. Um, uh, that, that would be really good. Uh, we've had questions in so far, so um, we, we can start to go through those after you've kind of been through the polls. Yeah. Right, um, yeah, and I think what was interesting about the polls is that digital, digital design um, lags far behind any of the others and i think that's really interesting because it's really a tool perhaps to achieve the remainder of the four attributes um so i, I think i would certainly um i would certainly concur with your results that that uh, collaboration and, and an inquisitive nature are really the things that uh, drive uh, i think designers in total forward and you know we couldn't do this without collaborating with the other engineers architects and, and makers that allow us to do these interesting projects. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think uh, I'm a bit surprised in some ways. Digital design is uh, is quite low down, and perhaps that's that that's a reflection on on us as engineers to promote what it is to people, so they can understand the value in it. I think um, uh, it, it, often it's seen as quite a broad. Um, uh, subjects and people it's a bit intangible to people so i, I hope that if we were to do this poll again in uh, a year's time uh, that that will go up and be a little bit more on an even keel with the rest of them but i think collaboration and uh, inquisitive nature and culture i mean it's good to see those ones of uh, leading from the front yeah um we've got a question in from paul so have you been able to gain knowledge from studying failures of installed large format glazing due to impact or handling? Um, well, we, we keep abreast of all the um, papers that go into do studies um, from failures. Um, unfortunately, we, we're also called in to do um, inspection work for failures. Um, and, and yes, the, you know, we can see where problems have occurred and yeah, that's that's always uh, very useful to be able to see what what's happening and uh, obviously it, it helps us to avoid those things for ourselves because we're learning the lessons unfortunately um but at someone else's expense um but uh, i think publish is very difficult really to share that knowledge because usually they're they're confidential and um if people were more happy to discuss things that went wrong then I think the the, envir the environment or the um, community could learn a lot more. But as ever, you you always tend to uh, talk about what's gone well. So 
Sorry, Kat, I can't hear you. Anything more to add on that one, perhaps? Uh, well, I think we're, we're, we're relatively lucky that the projects that we work on, we don't get uh, too many failures. And um, when it does happen, we often know the cause, so we don't have to investigate it in too much detail. But as Graham said, I think we learn, we learn more where we, where we come in, where we're brought in as um, external parties to look at other projects. Um, and, I, and I agree, I agree with Graham that I think sometimes we need to be a bit more open and sharing of knowledge, but I, I, yeah, I can understand why that is the case and I can't see it changing anytime soon, unfortunately. So we always keep them kind of in-house, don't we, and kind of don't really let the outside world know the whole problem with the legal challenges and things like that. So Absolutely, um, yes. Um, Anka has asked, um, I'm developing a distributed data modelling workflow to model curved facade dome structures. I wanted to ask you um, how to tackle, how do you tackle the design of nodes? What parameters do you take into account? Yeah. And he was asking this kind of, I think, when you're looking at the, um, yeah. the Iona dome. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I mean, that I mean um, in some ways, the nodes are the most critical aspects. The thing we zoom in on uh, at the start of the design uh, there's many different ways um, to connect elements together uh, and, and and to answer the question really the, the, there's a few th few things we need to think about uh, one is the fabrication and the costs obviously um, that go with it uh, on on the Iona project uh, weights were really critical and that's normally true of uh, most projects as well uh, using those machine although using those machined uh, nodes is often a little bit more heavier um, uh, other aspects are the visual, how it looks, actually. Do you want to express that structure? Normally you do. So um, having something which is um, fully bespoke uh, can be good uh, in that aspect. Also the geometry integration, so the number of uh, elements that you're coming into a node at one particular point and the twist in the, in, within the different elements and how you accommodate that is uh, often uh, a key consideration. And that, and that links with the, the wider uh, geometry optimization to try and make sure that you you know avoid uh, elements coming in at sharp angles and you try and spread spread the elements out across the across the envelope as much as possible um, and, a, and a kind of final thing is the is what you want the node to do um, sometimes you need uh, the node to perform uh, a lot harder if we're using if we're not using a triangular mesh and we're using a rectangular mesh for example uh, and we have seismic loads to consider, we we need to have those working as a, more of a moment connection. So that's another consideration that we need to take into account when we're tackling the nodes. Uh, what's your advice for young structural engineers, um, students? Say the question again, Kat, sorry. So what's so based on your kind of five attributes, yep. I suppose, what, what's your advice for an engineer uh, and student? My advice would be to, to not get too um, uh, typecast in your, too early on in your career. You know, I think we, it's quite natural. We go, we go and study, I studied uh, a structural engineering uh, degree and you kind of naturally fall into this, um, uh, this kind of role of, oh, okay, I'm a structural engineer and, you know, you can shout from the roofs that that's what you are. But I think that, the key thing is to just keep going, walk over to the other department, see what mechanical engineers are doing. My uh, friend at university was a mechanical engineer and he had the privilege to build a racing car, which I was very jealous of. But, you know, seeing them do those types of things and, 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 and you realise actually it's not, uh, we're not limited to, to those badges. I think that's probably the key thing I would say. Yeah, and I'd also add to that, just read around the subjects. You know, there's plenty of material out there now that's easily available on the internet and and so you know do some research and have a look and find out why something is the way that it is um, it's hugely important it's definitely the same because um, my my degree was a general engineering degree so i got to see all sorts of different types of engineering it really opens your eyes up to the kind of the different areas and how you need to collaborate with the engineers and different sorts and i think that's really valuable um, Eliana has asked, how do you integrate Grasshopper into your digital design process? Uh, I mean, you know, so it's, it's a key tool, really. It's not, it's not something we need to integrate. It's uh, one of the tools that we deploy uh, 
to do the digital design. It's, uh, so I think that we, it's, you know, it, it's developing all the time, all the bolt-ons and add-ons that, that, that are associated with it. So it's really about training and learning and, uh, and, and the people that are leading from the front, particularly within our office, helping to share that with other people. So it's not, it's not something which is uh, dedicated to uh, only special projects or a few people in the office. We want this to be used widely, really. So it's just a tool that we use like a uh, finite element analysis used to be perhaps something was more special that only a few people are using. Now we all use it. So hopefully uh, you know, Grasshopper will be something that we all using or, uh, or another similar software in the future. Basim has asked, um, what happened to the 116 panels of glass that were used for years in New York? Uh, do you have an idea of the total life cycle carbon cost of the installation or collect that information for your projects? Uh, historically, <laughs> we haven't, but, uh, historically, we haven't been doing that. Um, but obviously, with the climate change, that's come ever so more important. So we are calibrating what we do with regards to uh, the glass structures and working out what the what the costs of carbon we have in those projects i mean part of what we do is really try to reduce the amount that we use and a i mean it, it's but now you know we're understanding we're looking to how we can get that uh, waste glass back into the process um back into the processing uh, it, it goes back into the process as cullet so raw glass and that reduces um, the temp temperature at which the raw materials will melt. So adding cullets or waste glass back into the process reduces the carbon content. So we're working with a nip on sheet glass and AGC and others to work out, trying to work out better, uh, understand what these, uh, you know, these life cycle costs are. Um, I think the industry does have a part to play and they really are trying to catch up to understand how they can get more of the waste glass back into the system. Uh, only what I mentioned in the presentation that um, I think we, yeah. we've identified that it's something that we need to improve. Um, and, you know, the first step is to, is to just uh, collect that information and collectively as an industry all try and help each other out and share what we know um and uh, and and help to help to give uh, people uh, clients and architects the information to make decisions you know uh, at the moment we have to base it on uh, more general rules which is which is great and it and it's starting the discussion and that's what we have to do but I, I hope that we can we can really sort of tailor that you know for example um what's the difference between uh, having three smaller panels versus one bigger panel you know is, is one worse or one better uh, those sort of questions we um, we want to sort of delve a little bit deeper into. Uh, it's looking at the kind of sustainability aspects of glass, and I think that more will come out of that um, in terms of the research element of it and the development of that. Um, I mean, but what yeah. I mean, was particularly interesting with glass as a material it's infinitely recyclable. It's, it's a fantastic material for that, for that process. And, and so it's really just connecting all the parts of the system from the people demolishing the building to the people making the glass and making that, making that, uh, the cycle of, um, of glass, um, jo joining those different industries together to make that work. And that's what we're really trying to work towards now. Uh, we're all very much aware of it now and it's something that we are putting at the forefront of our mind to be able to do that so um, it's a really important issue um, so Ben I think has got a, um, a comment on the uh, the poll that we did in the results of the poll he said I think digital design is so low due to most firms being capable capable of digital design but falling behind in great collaboration and inquisitive nature what makes uh, EOC stand out yeah well I it's what have makes to agree it. with that. Yes, obviously. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, I guess yes. I mean, you know, it, it's. I think we uh, in in talked about earlier that we've been lucky enough to collaborate with um, fabricators and installers 
on a number of projects in a sequential way. So what we understand from one project gets fed back straight into the next project. So we get to make, um, you know, really, you know, quite, in, it, they're incremental leaps, but the way we can move forward in the technologies is much swifter than you might do um, for, you know, sporadic type project. Um, so I think that's really been the key to being able to develop um, these sorts of structures as quickly as we have been able to. Uh, so next ones, let's just see. There was another one. Um, just scrolling down now. Uh, in projects of this magnitude, how much time do you elaborate uh, the, uh, the experimental campaign and with whom do you work? Uh, is it universities or kind of areas like that? Yeah, I mean, it varies really. Um, a lot of the time we don't have the time, you know, to do uh, on these projects. And it's, it, it, you can understand it's difficult. Uh, schedules are set and, you know, it's always difficult then to throw in, you know, a six months research and development phase within that. But um, if, if projects have that time, sometimes it's worth just discussing early on with the clients to think about maybe you, you've got some chance to do some research and development. It might need a bit of investment. Uh, there's different investment streams. Some can come from the clients and can come from governments. But um, uh, yeah, I think more could happen uh, inside of projects. Uh, and then in terms of outside of projects, we work with uh, various universities. Um, uh, we work with you know, Cambridge University, uh, James is uh, sitting at Delft and we're doing a lot of work with them. Uh, but we also, we also try and initiate uh, development and research with the, with the contractors, with the, the makers for, for the next projects as well. So it, it happens on many different fronts and I think that's a, that's a good thing. nearing up to the hour now I think so um, how do you deal with design unknowns test results and the factor of safety that's not codified and at the same time have to provide design that is accepted by the client and their insurers um, so I think this is probably aimed at you Ian so most of the time it comes to a stage that the clients respond that all this process is fine but I cannot accept this on my project how do you tackle this and I guess I guess that's something which has come up on the Iona project quite a lot because it was a new area um, which hadn't been tried before in that particular uh, in that particular environment. So, uh, how, how did you come across that, and how did you um, deal with that? Uh, well, I think you just need to, you know, understand what they want first of all. What is a client trying to achieve, and then if you think of a better way that they can achieve that uh, through perhaps initiating some testing or doing something that hasn't been done before, then as long as you communicate the potential value that you might get at the end of that. Uh, um, and then they can weigh that up against the risks. Uh, that's that's how you resolve it. And I think the testing is the key, right? If you can do, if you can find that time to do the testing, then that that is the way to convince the convince the client. And also getting the um, uh, ha having a competent contractor who you know has a proven track record and can see the risks from their perspective from the installation. So it's it's a kind of combination of testing and also having the right people around the table that. Can, can give that give the client that confidence I think yeah and I think that it's clear that the testing really should be just qualifying um, you know the initial assumptions what we don't do is test blindly what we do is we have to have so, you know complete or well, ninety percent certainty that what we're trying to do will work and, and the testing really is to reinforce that or is a tool to which we can refine the design following that. It's not really, does it work or does it not? It tends to be, how well is it going to work? We should leave it for now. We're, we're, we're kind of pushed over our hour. So um, uh, yeah, I would just like to say thank you very much indeed to Graham and Ian, and thank you very much indeed for, um, for everybody who's kind of uh, tuned in. We've got some great, uh, We've got some great little mentions down here. People from uh, Hiroyuki, uh, we've got Toronto, um, we've got the Netherlands, Germany. So we've got loads of people tuning in. And it was, uh, it was really lovely to have you all here. So thank you very much indeed. And we hope to see you in the next one. Yep. Have a lovely thank evening, you. guys. And uh, right. take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.